up for this worship team. Come on. Look at this back row. Handsome and on point and very rhythmic. My name is Pastor Kurt, one of the pastors around here. We are starting a brand new series called The Blessed Life. Turn to your neighbor and say The Blessed Life. What is The Blessed Life? What is The Blessed Life? Um, it's a journey is what it is. My journey started about 35 years ago when I got married. I married someone who understands the blessed life. Um, I'm going to celebrate 35 years of marriage this July. Oh, you can applaud for her. Don't applaud for me. It's been a cakewalk for me. It's been a real cross for her. Um, I, once when we were, uh, we had young kids. Anyone here got young kids? Who, who's got young kids? Okay, this is a horrible time of life, young kids. <laughs> They're just, we are legion. They're just filled with demons. And uh, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have any privacy. We didn't have any grandparents. We didn't have anyone helping us out. And we were just getting razzled and frazzled. And I got asked to go speak at a conference in New Mexico. I actually got asked to go lead worship at a conference. I used to lead worship. Then I met Christian. I gave up. Um. And, and, and they said, you can bring your wife with you. All, all you have to do is just pay for her plane ticket, but her, her hotel and food and registration, all that will be free. Just you got to get her there. And we were just poor as dirt, but, but we saved up for several months. And I remember we saved up a significant sum of money to us, and it was going to be the money we're going to buy the, uh, the, the plane ticket with. And on the day we were going to purchase the plane ticket, she called me up and she said, hey, um, can you come over to my work? At lunch, because I, I got something I got to tell you. So I went over there at lunch. She said, I'm not buying that plane ticket, and I'm not going with you to New Mexico. Because this morning I was praying, and God told me to give that money to my sister. <laughs> Kelly's sister was having some struggles in her life, unemployment, other things. And we had given her money before, and money we didn't have to give before. And I said to her, I said to Kelly, I said, listen, I don't think that's good stewardship. I don't think that's what, we don't want to enable that. And she looked at me and she said, this ain't about what my sister's worthiness. This is about my obedience. Now, do you know that thing in marriage where they tell you that say, uh, both couples have to agree? Like well, you have to have two green lights before you decide anything big? My wife doesn't believe that. So we start having this argument, and she's like, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be obedient to the Lord. And she writes the check, and I'm saying, don't do that. And she's like, I'm going to do it. She writes a check. She puts it in an envelope. She addresses it. And we walk out to the mailbox, and we're fighting about it the whole time. I'm like, you know, the truth of the matter is mutual submission and this and that. And you've got to give me, we should pray about it. And she's like, no, I know. And she sticks it in the mailbox. And I literally thought about putting my hand inside that stupid mailbox. And we're arguing about it all the way back to her office. And we sit down in the office, and just then there's a knock at the office door, and I open it, and it's her boss. And her boss, Donnie, he looks at her, and he says, man, the weirdest thing happened. I got up this morning, I had my devotion time, and God told me out of the blue to give you a bonus. And he hands her a check for the same amount of money she just put in the mailbox. It's not often in marriage where you win an argument outright. She's holding that check looking at me. And that, that began my journey of learning how to let God form and shape my heart. And I'm still on the journey. I'm still on the journey. See, some of you, you've been touched by the blessed life. Some of you, you have touched the blessed life. Or it's touched you. What we want to do the next three weeks is I want to, I want to help you live in the blessed life. And it's not what you think. It's not what you think. That's what we're going to learn about today. The blessed life is not what you think. What is the blessed life? The key to the blessed life is simply this. To understand where we're at and to move where we need to be. It's more blessed to give than to receive, Acts 20, 35 says. Now, this material we're going to deal with comes from a guy named Robert Morris. Robert Morris wrote a book called The Blessed Life. He preaches on the blessed life at his church in Texas about once every three years. He literally thousands and thousands and thousands of churches have done this series, The Blessed Life. If you want to go online and look it up, you can see the original material. It's probably way better than what we're going to present or I'm going to present. But it's... It's the sort of thing that every time we do it here in Bayside, about once every five years, it absolutely transforms marriages, families, and most importantly, hearts. You see, here's the premise. We are all natural born getters. Every one of you is a generous person to yourself. Every one of you is a generous person 
to your own interests. We're born natural getters. 90% of all storage units in the world exist in America. We are very good at getting here. What we want to do is become supernatural born-again givers. And it's really important that you hear that word givers. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the attitude, the position. Okay, what do I mean by that? The context here of our passage, we're going to look at Deuteronomy. And I'm starting in the Old Testament because I want you to see the range and scope of this heart issue that God talks about. The, 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 the context here is the people of God are moving out of the desert. So they went from slavery to desert, and they're about to go into the promised land. It's a new generation. The generation that went into the desert has passed away. And Deuteronomy is written so that they will not forget the law of God and the primary nature and principles of God. Deuteronomy is a reminder of who God is. And in the midst of that reminder, he writes this. This is what he writes. However, there need to be no poor people among you. For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all the commands I give you today. Now, what's he talking about no poor people here? They had this rule in the nation of Israel where every seven years all debt was wiped out. All student loans, all credit... How many would like that rule to be in our world, right? Everyone but the mortgage brokers rose, raised their hand. They just wiped out all the debt. And he said, listen, there, there doesn't need to be any reason for you to be poor if you'll understand this principle. What's the principle? Verse 6. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites, in any of the towns or the land the Lord your God is giving you, about to give you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts is coming, so that you do not show ill will towards the needy among you, your fellow Israelites, and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Stinginess was a major concern of God, especially at the beginning of taking the promised land. See, we like to talk about the sensational sins. We like to talk about adultery. We like to talk about drunkenness. We like to talk about cheating and all that stuff. But God thinks stinginess of the heart is as serious as those other sins. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. In other words, don't go, hey, next year is all going to be forgiven. I'm not going to do anything this year. I'm going to just let them be poor. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. There's so many points we can make about this. And it's important to look at this because it's foundational to the people of Israel. But the bottom line point, the bottom line point is simply this. God's got your needs when you're concerned about the needs of others. When you're a giver, God is a giver. When you have an unstingy heart, God will take care of you. Fundamentally, people say, well, this is the nation of Israel. This is a New Testament. No, this is the nature of God. God loves a cheerful giver. Um, I, I, I was traveling quite a bit uh, when we first moved to Elk Grove because we were very, very poor. And I was saying yes to every opportunity I could to go get an honorarium. And we were just really struggling to make ends meet. I don't know if anyone remembers 2006 when the housing market was going down. So our, our house was losing value and we had challenges and challenges on our bills and so I was gone quite a bit and I remember I was gone for like one 10 day stint right before Thanksgiving and I finally got back home so good to see the kids I walk in the house they come up and hug me it's going to be Thanksgiving weekend I'm going to get some time off and I look at our formal dining room and the brand new dining room table we had bought when we moved into that house and we had never spent any more we spent more on that piece of furniture we've ever spent on any piece of furniture in our marriage brand new dining room table and chairs gone 
I said, well, what, what, what happened to the dining room table and chairs? And Kelly said, well, I, I gave them to the neighbor. I said, why did you give our dining room table to the neighbor? Because they don't have a dining room table. I said, yeah, but now we don't have a dining room table. And she said, yeah, but we're Christians. That Thanksgiving, we sat on the floor and ate on the floor, and it's one of my kids' favorite Thanksgiving ever. You see, God takes care of those who are not worried about being taken care of, but are worried about taking care of their brothers. What does it mean that the journey changes everything? Three principles, three hard things that God's trying to do in us. The first thing is God's trying to help us deal with our naturally self-centered heart. We have a selfish heart. Listen, this is so important for you to understand. This is not about money. This is about our heart. I want you to look at two parallel passages here and compare them to that Deuteronomy passage. So God starts over the people of Israel. He says, if you're worried about others, I'll take care of you. And then Jesus teaches this. He says, do not judge or you will be judged. What's he talking about? It's a heart issue. You, if you have a judgmental heart, you're going to get judgmental hearts pointed at you. It's a heart issue. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This doesn't mean don't have high moral standards or don't point out wrong. It's a heart issue. God is saying if you're a judgmental heart, you'll have a judgmental heart back at you. Do not judge, or you will be judged. What's the final thing? It will be measured to you as you measure others. The amount of judgment you give is the amount of judgment you'll get. Now let's look at the parallel passage, because this is really interesting. Let's look at the parallel passage in Luke 6, 37 and 38. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. It's the same exact principle, correct? Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. It's, uh, it's a parallelism. He's repeating it again. The con condemnation you give is the condemnation you get. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. So all heart issues, right? Well, watch this. Here's what Luke adds when Luke is actually quoting Jesus. Give and it will be given to you. Deuteronomy exactly. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus in both passages is talking about the condition of our heart. If our heart is hard towards others, we will get hard harder. You will get what you give. I cannot tell you married people enough how much you've got to learn this lesson. If you want affection in your marriage, you've got to give affection. You want listening in your marriage, you've got to give listening. You want loyalty, you've got to give loyalty. You want truth, you've got to give truth. You, uh, Robert Morris tells this hilarious story about a woman who's in crisis because her kids are misbehaving. And he says, come into the office and we'll talk. And so she comes into the office and she can't afford babysitting, so all three kids are with her. He's like, it's not a problem at all. They can be right out here with my assistant. We'll keep the door open between my office and the assistants, you'll be able to hear what the kids are doing and watch them, and then you and I can chat about what's going on in your family. And she goes in there, immediately she breaks down, she says, I'm, I'm, I'm being yelled at by my kids. They don't respect me, and they yell at me every day. Just then something happened with her kids, and she turned around and said, shut up in there, I'm talking to the pastor. <laughs> he said, I wonder why they're giving you yelling. We get, this is just the principle. We get what we give. But it's super important to understand this. Uh, a, a, a journalist said to Robert Morris, because he's so famous and known for this, she said, how many weekends a year at your church do you talk about giving? He said, oh, every weekend, 52 times a year. So every sermon's about giving. So he, said, he said, but what you mean to ask me is how many times a year do I talk about finances? And that would be once every three years we do a little series on finances and stewardship. But we talk about giving because it's impossible to teach about God without teaching about giving. You can't teach about God's grace because God so loved the world he gave. You can't teach about marriage because the Bible says to give each other mutual submission. You can't teach about worship because the Bible says to give God an offering of praise. Because God has given us so much, it's all giving. And we've got to look at our heart and go, do I understand this? See, here's the point. It's not about the dollar. It's not about the dollar. God doesn't need your dollar. God, God is not up there worried about tax day. Did I put enough away? Do I got all those protections? 
God has no accountant. There is no Excel sheet. It's about the devotion that God wants from your heart. Giving is not God's way of raising money. It's God's way of raising people. Here's the principle. Giving and having a heart that is unselfish is the most powerful way to have a strong heart. You want a stronger heart? Have a giving heart. Giving helps your heart become more thankful, grateful, generous, and strong. This is why you can't give to give. This is why all of that positive faith, blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. How many have ever heard this stuff? Where, you know, you, you, your words have the power of positivity and the thing, if you confess it and it'll come to you. And that's, that's baloney and it's not, I had an old pastor friend, he says, the, that positive confession stuff, that giving to get, it only works in oil states. Six of you will get that. It's a lot of cash and oils. Okay, let's keep moving on. Um, <laughs> I'm going to still tell that joke next service, Jason Crow. I'm going to tell. The, the point is, you don't give to get. You give to get a different heart. To become a better mom, a better dad, a better husband, a better student, a better coworker, a better teammate, a better roommate. Giving is not God's way of raising money. Giving is God's way of raising people. Step two, I'll write it in. You have to deal with a fearful heart. Once you acknowledge, okay, my default disposition is self-interest, then you start getting, you get a little afraid. Okay, what's going to happen if I really give myself over to this journey? If I really give myself over to this dealing, to this journey? Well, what's going to happen is two things. You, you're going to have selfishness before and grief after. Selfishness before. Can we really afford to do this? And grief after should we have done this? And, and I can teach you how to overcome this. It's very easy to overcome the instinct of selfishness before giving and the instinct of grief after giving. Um, who can give me 20 bucks? Who can give me 20 bucks? Oh, thank you. Wow. Do you see, do you see how eager he was to give me that 20 bucks? Do you see how eager he was to do it? He just had it right there. You know why he was so eager? Because I gave him this 20 bucks before the service. And I told him when I asked who could give me 20 bucks to be super eager. See, he understood two principles about this 20 bucks. It wasn't ever his. And he understood that I had some instructions behind it. See, when you think the money's yours, that's when you're tempted to be selfish and griefful. But when you understand that every single penny that you have, every single opportunity that you were given, every single talent that you have, every single resource that comes into your life is from your grace-filled heavenly Father who wants to bless you beyond what you deserve. When you understand it's his, you're not giving away your money. You're giving away his. That's the fundamental difference between me and my wife. I grew up poor. Therefore, I grew up with this thought, I'm never going to be poor. I'm not going to let myself be poor. I will work harder. I will learn more. I'll be smarter. I will not be poor. I can't stinking stand that last week of the month when there's no food. How many know, how many ever lived in that household? I'm not, not going to happen to me. My, I grew up poor. My wife grew up super poor. She grew up super, super poor. It wasn't the last week of the month. It was every week of the month. And so what she learned is it's all faith anyway. It's all faith anyway. She just learned you got to trust God and you got to lean into God. And this isn't our money and the only way we're going to make it is by trusting God. So she loves giving God's money away. And I have to train myself to go, that felt like my money. Because I have the 1099. And the W-2, but she's like, no, this is God's. This is God's dining room table. This is God's check. See, what she's done is she's learned to develop a generous heart, and that's step three. Just a, just a heart that enjoys the moment of giving. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 15, 14. Supply them liberally from your flock. These are the former slaves that have come into the land from conquest. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. 
give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Kelly's come through so much and seen so many miracles. She's just that person who loves the moment of generosity, the moment of generosity. My wife um, likes to go vintage shopping. Does anyone know what vintage shopping is? Vintage shopping. Well, that means you're going to the Goodwill near Granite Bay. <laughs> if you're just going to the Goodwill out here, it's just secondhand shopping. But if you go to the one near Granite Bay, and, and about five or six years ago, she found this vintage coat. It's like a 1950s coat. It's blue velvet. It's gorgeous. And it was in mint condition, like not a thread out of place, not a stain on it. And it's a, it's a beautiful formal winter coat. And she would only wear it like two or three times a year around Christmas. We'd go to a Christmas party, and she'd bring it out. And every time she would bring it out, people would go nuts for that coat. And they'd go, oh, my gosh, where did you get that coat? And she said, I got it at the Goodwill near Granite Bay for 10 bucks." And they're like, ah, oh, I can't believe that. And she's like, yeah, and it's, it's, it's a fine. What an incredible fine. And the label is some designer. I don't remember who it is, but they're all impressed. Taro from Makuni, he saw it once. He's like, i got to have that coat. I think he wanted to make pants out of it. And, um, <laughs> and it's just, she really loves this coat. She really loves this coat. And every time she brings it out, it's great. So we were uh, with a bunch of our staff for a Christmas party. And one of the young staff members asked her the story. She told her the whole story. And, and she said, man, I love that coat. I, I wish I could get a coat like that. Kelly went home, took the coat off, got a box, folded the coat up nice, put it in there, wrapped it up, brought it to work the next day and said, here's your coat. Here's your coat. A couple of weeks ago, I'm not making this up. That was Christmas. A couple of weeks ago, my wife walks in with our daughters from going secondhand shopping and she's got the identical coat in her hand. And another one, two of them, two different colors, 10 bucks each. She found one a couple weeks before, and when she walks, she grabs another color, she goes, goes I gave one away. <laughs> now, do we give to get? Unless you're Kelly Harlow, I mean, she kind of does. I mean, She's kind of proven all those word faith people correct. No, the funny thing is, that moment was a fun moment because it's so predictable now. She, when she gives away things, she goes, what's the Lord going to do? I said, well, I'd sit back and watch it. But I guarantee her, knowing her, the moment that was fun for her was not the second coat moment. It was the give in the box moment. It was the watching that young staff person go, what, what? And she's happier than you because of that. She's happier than me because of that. Because when you say, God, I admit it, I got a selfish heart, and I'm a little fearful about going on this journey and letting you do whatever you want to do in my heart, and you break through that to a generous heart, you get to live a world of fun. Once you realize that when God says, if you'll take care of other people, I'll take care of you, and he means it, he means it, he means it. Jesus wants us to live in the beauty of unrestrained generosity. Just there's no limits. There's no cap on it. We're always listening. We're always open. What did Jesus say in Luke? It's the passage right before that. If you love those, or give to everyone who asks. Give to everyone who asks. What if you... We're a give to everyone who asks person. If you gave them generosity, if you gave them a great attitude, if you gave them affection, you are just living for the opportunity. You're just looking for the opportunity to be a giver. What would happen? You'd get stronger. You'd get happier. You'd get better. Because your heart would change. And here's the last step. Develop a grateful heart. And uh, Kelly's uncomfortable with me telling all these stories about her, and I don't care. Um, <laughs> because I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that that little bit of stinginess that was put into me by the, the, the cycle of poverty thing that was happening in my family, I'm so grateful God said, let's put him with her. Because that will be good for her. I remember one of the first times I had this experience, and this is the last story I'm going to tell you on this. Um, we went down to Cal State Stanislaus when we were very young, right out of college, to start a campus ministry at Cal State Stanislaus in Turlock. I'd never heard of Turlock. I'd never heard of Cal State Stanislaus. 
We had asked our friends to support us financially, and a bunch of our friends said, we'll give money to you monthly to go do that, and it was $500. I thought I was like, it was so rich. It was like $500 every month to go do ministry. And we moved in this place right across from Cal State Stanislaus. It's there to this day. It was called The Net. And, and we had free rent there. We paid $1 on the lease for a year. So we had free rent and $500. I'm like, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to have so much money. And I got down there, and the first month, half of the people said that they would support me didn't support me. And so after we paid uh, for our utilities in that place and went and bought one round of groceries, we had like 17 dollars in the bank, $17.38 I think it was, and I was just panicking. We were literally having no food in the house after a couple of weeks. We had like one half a loaf of bread and one half a box of cereal, and I went into the office one day, my office, and I got down on my knees and I said, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, where are you? God, I'm doing this for you. I sacrificed everything for you. We're down to nothing. This is going to be humiliating. I can't even feed my bride. God, where are you? And then God spoke. Now, pastors like to tell all these stories about when God spoke to them. I want to tell you, this happens to me twice a decade. God spoke as clear as I'm sitting here today. God dropped right in my spirit, and he said, feed every student you meet. I was like, God, I can't feed every student. I can't even feed my own self and my bride. Feed every student you meet. I didn't say amen or anything. I got right up from hearing it the second time, and I went into the kitchen. Kelly was right there, and I said, I just had the weirdest experience of my life. I said, I just heard so clearly from God that we're supposed to feed every student we meet. I said, what do you think that means? That means, like, teach them the word of God, like, feed my sheep, like Jesus said to Peter. And my wife looked at me, and just with absolute faith, she said, no, no, here's what it means. Feed <laughs> every student you mean? I said, we can. She said, God will provide, don't worry. She leaves to go run some errands. Half an hour later, half an hour later, knock at the door, open the door, two students that I don't know from Adam, don't know their names. I've been on campus for like three weeks, don't know these students. They're like, hey, Pastor Kurt, um, your wife told us to bring these groceries in. She bought some groceries, and they have like eight bags of groceries. It's roast beef, donuts, pasta, milk, bread, rolls, hot dogs, hamburger. They're unloading everything, and I think to myself, here's the man of faith that I am. I think, my wife has written a bad check. <laughs> She's so filled with faith, she went out to Safeway and did a criminal act. An hour later, she comes home. I said, what in the world were you doing buying these groceries? And she said, I didn't buy those groceries. Those students were lying to you. They bought those groceries. You, you, can't you see that? And so I called one of the students up, and I said, come over. You're coming over for dinner, and bring as many students as you can. She brought about 10 students, and we just started feeding them. The next night, we had 10 more students over, and, and, and the next night, three of those students accepted Christ. And then the next night, we had like 10 more students over, and two more students accepted Christ. And we just did this night after night after night. And then one day, I got a call, phone call from a guy named Mike Herrera. He drove a Fritos uh, Lay's potato chip truck. He said, sometimes the potato chips go post-date. They get bad. Can I give all the uh, potato chips to you? So all of a sudden, we started getting like thousands of pounds of potato chips every week. I got a call the next day from another guy who said, I work at a submarine sandwich shop, and every Friday I'm going to bring you like a 12-foot long submarine sandwich for the students. I'm like, that's amazing. That's incredible. Then I started calling my supporters. And they're like, oh, yeah, we forgot. We got it all handled. And the support money started just coming in and coming in and coming in. And we invited so many students over. Every night of the week we had students at our table. And we would be out there on campus, and I'd say to a student, I'd say, hey, you want to come to dinner at my house with a bunch of other students tonight? And they'd say, yeah, sure. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? And then my students would laugh. Because they'd be like, you're going to get saved. That's what's going to happen there. That's <laughs> what happens every night there. And we'd bring them over. And we'd eat pasta. And we'd laugh. And then I'd tell them the gospel and say, you want to accept Christ? And they, the next thing we know, we had like 100 students coming to our group. And one day I got up and I prayed. And I said, God, thank you. It's amazing. What a lesson to me. What a powerful, powerful. And I, and I, and I kind of, my attitude I said, God, I got this. The support's coming in now. The cupboards are full. The students are coming over. I got this. And God said, nah, nah. I went to church that Sunday. Get done with church. I'm walking out to my car. This lady comes over and stops me. And she says, uh, God spoke to me about you guys this week. 
said, really? She said, I'm a real generous person. I just like to look for opportunities. And usually I just keep some cash on me. And whenever God tells me, I just give $100 here, a couple hundred there, and I'm just a real generous person. My, my husband, I'm a widower, started this pizza place. And um, I, I, I've just done really well, and I want to be a grateful, generous person. And I was like, okay, okay. And she said, first of all, uh, how many pizzas do you think you need a week to feed all those students? I said, I don't know, 12, 13. She goes, come and get uh, six or eight on Wednesday and come and get another six or eight on Friday. On me, all the pizza you want. You have to understand, at this point in my life, my favorite food was pizza. This was like Jesus, <laughs> this is like Jesus coming into the room physically, touching the wound. He's like, all the pizza. And then she said this to me. She said, Kurt, um, I was going to give you some cash. But God told me to not give you cash. That's an interesting thing to hear. <laughs> and she pulled an envelope out, and she handed me an envelope. So we're polite. We went, we went in the car, and we opened it up. And in the envelope was $500 of Safeway uh, gift certificates. She said, I don't know, a little no, I don't know why God told me to give you to you in this way. But I'm assured by him you would understand. Feed every student you meet. I'll tell you, there's not a week of my ministry goes by that I'm not reminded of that season where my wife helped me be obedient to caring about the needs of others. And in that obedience, I saw God not just meet my needs. Well, that's not what God wants to do for you. He doesn't want to just meet your needs. He wants you to live in a blessed life. We can never separate gratitude and generosity. Once we understand how benevolent our God is, how good our God is, how he's the God of groceries and potato chips and Subway sandwiches and just when we think He's been so good to us that he can't be any more good to us. He's the God of pizza and Safeway. <laughs> because when we'll overcome our selfishness, step over our fear, and start living in the excitement of generosity, we will actually see that when we take care of others, he does take care of us above and beyond what we ask or imagine. Can I pray for us? Father God, thank you so much for this next three weeks. There's a single mom in here and she's struggling to make ends meet. Show her how good you are, God. There's a couple on the verge of retirement wondering if they have enough. There's a teenager who's just starting out this journey. There's a dad with small kids, worried if he's putting enough away for their college. There's this 30-something wondering if they'll ever be able to afford a house. God, you see all of these cares. You see all of these concerns. You see all of the things that worry and weigh down our heart. And in response, you say, trust me, trust me, trust me. God, I pray we would grow in trust. And as we grow in trust, our hearts would grow in strength. And that we truly would walk and live in the blessed life. I just pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said.